Hello everyone. Welcome back to this final session of Introduction to Lightning Observations and Applications. This is part three. And today we will talk about geostationary lightning mapper or GLM observations, lightning data access and applications. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Scott Rudlowski from NOAA Nestis STAR. We started last week with background and history of lightning measurements. And then last session was about current lightning data products from remote sensing and also from suborbital depth jobs. Today, we'll focus on GLM observations and applications. Today being the last session, we have posted the homework on our training website. Uh, so please access that. As in the last two sessions, please put your questions in the questions box or chat box, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. And feel free to enter your questions as we go. Um, if we cannot cover all the questions, uh, we will take care of them later and post the question and answer document on the training web page. That brings us to today's session, and we want to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, also, again, I want to um, acknowledge Dr. Christopher Schultz from NASA Marshall, who we introduced uh, in first session. He has been a great contributor and coordinator for this training. And now, uh, Dr. Scott Rudlowski, uh, he is a NOAA Nestis physical scientist who splits time between offices at the University of Maryland and Kent State University. Dr. Rudlowski graduated from Ohio State University in 2004 and Florida State University in 2007 and 2011. As the science lead for both the GOES-R and GEOXO lightning mappers, his work helps ensure the availability, understanding, and application of lightning data from both ground and space-based observability networks. His NOAA position has provided the privilege of mentoring dozens of scholars at various stages of their high school, undergraduate, graduate, and uh, postgraduate studies. So next, uh, we invite Dr. Rudlowski. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. And as was mentioned before, I'll be describing geostationary lightning mapper observations and applications. So the geostationary lightning mapper is the first of its kind instrument. We continue to discover new things daily. Two GLMs now provide continuous real-time lightning monitoring throughout most of the Western hemisphere, uh, all the way from New Zealand in the Southwest to just off the coast of Africa. Uh, the GLM capabilities and products and the applications continue to evolve. So here's two videos which clearly show that the GLM is a lightning imager rather than a detector with very fine temporal resolution. So here's two views, one from goes east and one from goes west of the same lightning flash. And so you can see the GLM is able to uh, string together these, piece together these flashes as they occur uh, and give you quite a bit of detail uh, in, in terms of where the lightning traversed. Uh, we've still only scratched the surface in terms of the instrument's capabilities and the operational applications. So despite a relatively coarse resolution of roughly 10 by 10 kilometers uh, per pixel, uh, the GLM does provide quite a bit of detail as you can see in this zoomed in view. Uh, in the background there, we have a combined goes east and goes west flash density, and the, the pop-out box zooms in to South America to show uh, just how fine scale uh, the detail is to show um, the effects of the topography on the lightning distributions. The GLM patterns, uh, it, it resolves seasonal shifts that match our expectations from other lightning observation data sets. The GLM data has uh, improved quite substantially since the instrument first launched. And so what you see, the, these left panels uh, are for the GOES West GLM, and the right panels are for the GOES East GLM. And these, these are showing three months, December, January, February of 2018 and 2019, all the way through March, April, May of 2020. And what you see in these top panels here is, is quite a bit of noise and, and unnatural artifacts that 
uh, we were able to uh, develop filters and tune other filters to help improve the observation so that when you get down to these bottom panels, you can see much more natural looking lightning distributions. And so a couple of the really important filters were blooming and second level threshold filters. Uh, they help to deal with uh, issues with uh, stray light and uh, reflections or glint off the surface. Here's a depiction of a world record lightning flash. What you see in the background in the gray shades is that 3D volume of the cloud. And what you're seeing in the white, the white lines, that's the GLM observations strung together uh, to show this incredible flash as it evolves. And so this flash occurred in the Southeast United States, uh, just off the coast of Texas. And uh, I'll let it circle through again here so you can see uh, just here's from the end, you can see just how intricate the detail is. Uh, Michael Peterson put together this, this animation and he's actually estimated whether the light source was coming from low in the cloud, middle of the cloud or the top of the cloud. And so there's some 3D volume that he's able to put in uh, with the 2D GLM observations. And so if, you, if you'd like to see more detail about that specific flash, well, we have this ArcGIS story map, which goes into quite a bit of detail on how it evolved, the meteorology behind it, and, and what's significant about it. So, but this world record flash covered a horizontal distance of nearly 500 miles. Uh, there was a, another world record flash for duration that occurred in South America uh, that was documented at the same time. This animation here shows what this might look like from beneath. The vertical lines that you're seeing are connecting from the GLM to known strike points that are reported by a ground-based network. And so I'll play this through here. You can see that the lightning flashes evolve overhead and just how many times this lightning came to ground during its, uh, during its evolution. Uh, hundreds of times this lightning, this one lightning flash stuck, struck ground uh, as it traversed this nearly 500 mile distance. And so this is, is pretty cool to look at with a VR headset as well. If you're able to return, there's a link to it in the story map there. So the geostationary light mapper is used quite a bit by National Weather Service forecasters. And what I've shown here, this is an animation of the flash extent density. It's the frequency of lightning. Uh, that's what's shaded. And then the yellow and red polygons are severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings as issued as drawn by National Weather Service forecasters. And so as that loops back through, what I'll draw your attention to is the warmer colors indicate more frequent, uh, more frequent lightning flashes. And those just want to note how often those are co-located with the severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. And so with the GLM observations, they're fundamentally different from the ground-based networks that forecasters were traditionally use, used to using. And so we developed a new suite of gridded products that are tailored for the weather service operations. This helps us to disseminate the spatial footprint of the lightning, and it also greatly reduces the file size. And so what you're seeing here are the GLM gridded products, and they're produced on a two by two kilometer fixed grid. As I showed on the previous slide, the, the most commonly used product is what's called the flash extent density, and that reports the number of flashes coincident with each grid cell during a specified time period. The updraft cores are often indicated by greater flash extent density values or warmer colors. The, this is important because the most frequent lightning is often co-located with the severe weather. Um, and, and one thing to note also is that the rapid updates can be too rapid. What I'm showing here is what we call the five minute window product. And this accumulates five minutes of GLM observations, but it updates every minute. And if I click ahead here, you'll see this is the one minute depiction. And you can see that that could be really noisy uh, and can be distracting. It can also be useful at times too. And so forecasters go, be, go back and forth between the two, but most commonly it's the window products that the forecasters are using. The second most commonly used product is what's called the minimum flash area. And as the name suggests, it just reports the size of the smallest flash that's coincident with each pixel uh, during the specified time period. And the small flashes are most common in the new and intense convection along the leading line. 
You can see in this case, the yellows and greens are along the leading line, whereas the larger flashes are in the stratiform and anvil region. So you can see the purple uh, in the trailing stratiform region of this animation. And the third product that the Weather Service uses is what's called the total optical energy. And all that is is an accumulation of all optical energy that's observed within each grid cell during the specified time period. And within the TOE, the bright regions indicate the most energetic convective cores. And also in the stratiform region where the lightning's closer to the cloud top, you can also uh, get a, a visual depiction of where the lightning channels are traversing. The imagery that I've shown here, this is from Weather Nerds. I'll provide a little bit more details on this later, but I've provided a link here. And what you see is that the total optical energy overlaid on some IR imagery during a tropical cyclone hurricane uh, back in 2020. Zooming in on the Weather Nerds website, one thing I wanted to note is that in addition to the gridded products, you can also overlay the GLM level two products. And those are the, the base products that come out of the goes our ground system. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was an end of a National Weather Service application. And what they've used the GLM a lot for is uh, detecting long flashes. And so I won't go into a lot of detail on this conceptual model, but this is showing a cross section of a, a thunderstorm uh, moving to its right. Uh, along here, you have the leading line, the leading updrafts, and you have the trailing stratiform region back here. And we're talking about lightning that's occurring back in this location. If I click forward, I can show this animation where you have a lightning flash start in the main convective line and then propagate backwards into this trailing stratiform region and became quite elaborate, uh, very extensive flash, uh, likely came to ground dozens of times, if not more than 100, uh, over a nearly eight second duration, 7.86 seconds that this flash lasted. So really extensive flashes occurring in this trailing stratiform region. And again, you can see it stretched all the way from the Gulf Coast uh, com completely across the state of Louisiana. And so applying this application to the conceptual model, our forecaster might use this in operations. This base product that is displayed here is what's called a sandwich product. It combines the infrared and visible channels to provide a, a really nice depiction of thunderstorms as they evolve. The overlay radar, which forecasters use for just about everything when it comes to convective warnings. And then you can overlay the GLM. And so you can see this is where in the southern part of the storm is where the most obvious threat is, uh, but there's quite a bit of lightning occurring up here to the north in this uh, less obvious convective region. What I've shown here now is the pluses and minuses. These are from a ground network showing that the lightning was estimated to have come to ground in all of these different places during this, uh, I think, five-minute period of time. And the squares are cloud flashes as reported from the ground, ground-based network. So you can see with the ground-based network, you could tell that there's some lightning at a distance, but you not, might not know that it's connected all the way back uh, to this initial or main convection. And so then putting that into motion, you can see that this isn't just a one-off occurrence as this very intense convective line moves to the southeast here, you get repeated flashes back up in the stratiform region. And you can actually see that both the cell to the north and the line to the south are producing flashes that are propagating back into that region. So really an impressive setup, which occurs quite often uh, during the convective season in the, the lower 48. And then it, think if you imagine if you're a forecaster uh, advising either a, a large venue or in this case, the two yellow uh, circles here depict airports. Um, or if you're an airport operator trying to determine whether you should cancel operations or bring people off, um, off of the tarmac, uh, this is a really useful way to, to depict the lightning uh, when it might not be as obvious. And so in this case, there's a, a long line of storms. I'll play this through again. There's a long line of storms down uh, northern Alabama and northern Georgia. And as it's progressing slowly to the north, northeast, it's producing giant flashes that are stretching all the way up to Nashville and uh, producing quite frequent flashes that pose an obvious threat now to the uh, operations of those airports. So now I'd like to move into more of a summary of 
the geostationary lightning mapper applications. And what we did a few years back was we produced a value assessment to advise future satellite architecture decisions. And so this study evaluated the GLM value by documenting benefits to the public via decisions made by end users. And so uh, we use operational use cases to help illustrate the GLM value being realized through operational decisions by a wide variety of decision makers, both within the weather service and outside the weather service. And so here's another animation, a depiction I'll show you where, where to get and download imagery just like this later. Uh, showing a, another tropical system impacting the southeastern United States. So the link here will take you to this value assessment and it identified wide ranging economic and societal benefits, especially when the data are combined with other data sets, which is nearly always the case. Here are the GLM application areas that we detailed within the study and I'll go over most of them today very briefly. Uh, the first one we talk about is improving lightning safety. So the GLM improves lightning safety across broad segments of society related to a number of different applications. Uh, it's a new freely available data set. And so folks that didn't traditionally have access to it now have access to lightning data. Uh, in this case, what I'm showing on the left here, this is a lightning flash that occurred during a fireworks dis display, uh, posing an obvious threat or risk. And so you see this flash actually came to ground two different places, uh, more than 10 miles apart. And so as this video plays back through, you'll see the flash comes overhead of the, the camera and comes to ground in the foreground. And here's the first one. And then after that first cloud of ground flash, the, it continues to propagate along cloud base and comes to ground a second time closer to the fireworks display. In the middle here, this is what you would see if you were just using the ground-based networks. It's hard to tell um, which of these storms are producing the lightning. And with the GLM, what you can see is this entire area is producing lightning. And very likely, these two storms are producing lightning that are talking to each other, for lack of a better word. Uh, the, the charging in one is influencing the lightning in the other and vice versa. And so the forecaster now is able to kind of connect, see the full picture of the lightning threat in this case. The application that we were most excited about when the GLM first launched was severe weather warnings and thunder, th severe thunderstorm and tornadoes. And so we found that integrating the GLM into the severe weather warning process promotes earlier and easier warning decisions, a better assessment of the aerial coverage of the hazards, fewer false alarms, especially during radar outages and in regions with poor radar coverage. On the bottom, those four panels are, are showing what the animation I already depicted that I already showed you, the close co-location between the flash extent density and the severe weather. Uh, and then on the right here, this is from a survey of forecasters at the Huntsville Forecast Office. And this is, uh, in what ways do you use the GLM during convective events? And so you like to see some words here that are awareness, confidence, warnings. So good to see that it's being used uh, and being uh, applied to this particular application. Another application that's very important is improving the safety and effectiveness of wildfire response. So the GLM is able to benefit the firefighting community through the unique identification of continuing current flashes. Uh, and those flashes are most likely to ignite fires. It also helps to better characterize pyrocumulonimbus clouds. Uh, and it helps with track, thunderstorm tracking in areas that lack robust radar coverage. What I've shown in the bottom here, this is a pyrocumulonimbus. So a fire generated thunderstorm. And so you can see the smoke in the infrared and then if you see the heat in the infrared, the cloud developing, and then you see the lightning occurring. The lightning data assimilation is still relatively new, especially the GLM lightning data assimilation, but the early results indicate many benefits, especially for short range forecasts of radar reflectivity, accumulated precipitation and lightning threat in the convection allowing models. And so there's been a number of studies published that I reference to here. The GLM helps to improve precipitation estimation, uh, especially in areas without adequate radar coverage. So Western US, Hawaii, the US ter territorial islands is where it provides the most benefit, uh, but it helps to augment the satellite only precip estimates by um, better conveying where the convection is and where the stratiform regions are. 
I have a link there to some uh, comet training on flood forecasting. Uh, another one we're excited about is improving climate applications. And so the GLM data are able to provide unique insights for monitoring climate scale variability and response in a changing climate. There's a very close link between lightning and convective cloud property, and this makes it an essential indicator of both interannual and decadal change, uh, and also a key variable for validating climate models. And so I've shown a couple of images that you've seen before here uh, to, to illustrate that we have now this continuous coverage over a very broad area, and have had so for over five years now. And so the, the climatology is building and we're, we're able to start making some, some more clear insights into how the climate is evolving through these observations. The GLM and, and other satellite data sets help to fill uh, data gaps. And in this case, we're talking about radar coverage gaps. There's very, very good radar coverage over the continental United States. Uh, but even with that, there's a lot of regions where the, the coverage isn't perfect and um, needs to be augmented by other data sets. And so uh, the, the broad spatial and, broad and rapid temporal updates complement the radar data, um, both when the radars are working and when they're not. And so I've shown some images on the bottom here of radars that have been damaged by severe weather. And obviously when this is the case, other data sets are needed to help fill that radar coverage gap until they can be brought online. Another one, we, we characterize the value of mitigating aviation hazards. And what I've shown here, here's an animation of a day in the life of flights over the CONUS. And you can see in a lot of cases, the aircraft avoid. This is the GLM flash extent density with the tornado and severe thunderstorm warnings drawn on here. Um, but the forecasters use the radar data and the lightning data uh, to help guide these planes and the pilots themselves use these data to help make better decisions on routing uh, when thunderstorms are threatening. And so when we talk about the aviation hazards, it's important to note two different uh, applications. There's both the airport operations and then the flights when they're en route. And so in terms of airport operations, it gives the, the decision makers more confidence when they're suspending or continuing ramp operations. So that helps to enhance safety and improve efficiency and provides cost savings. Um, and then as I was showing here, uh, when the flights are en route, there's a number of decision makers that are using this information to help keep those planes safe. Another one I would like to note is uh, improving tropical cyclone diagnosis and warning. So the GLM is able to clearly convey convector patterns below cloud top and tropical cyclones. So this helps the forecasters to better diagnose TC structure and how it's evolving. Uh, and this really does help aid forecasts of tropical cyclone intensity, including rapid intensification. So the first animation I'll show here, this is Hurricane Ian near its inception. And you can see the lightning over top of the visible imagery. And what forecasters are looking for here is they're really trying to identify as, as accurately as possible, where is the center of circulation? Because the better they get that diagnosed, the better the models are going to be at forecasting this hurricane uh, or the eventual hurricane. And so this is the GLM and other data sets combined to help the forecasters pinpoint that center, center of circulation. And then later on, here's a depiction of, uh, depiction of Hurricane Ian less than a week later as it's making landfall as a devastating hurricane in Southwest Florida. And what you can see is a you know, tr tremendous eye here with lightning nearly encircling the entire eye, uh, indicating a very intense storm uh, making landfall. And so the, the, both the intensity and the spatial scale of the storm is really remarkable. Uh, and the lightning helps to, to round out the picture and put everything in perspective. So to summarize that GLM value assessment, um, only four years since becoming reality, the GLM has shown to be establishing a legacy of applications likely to become ubiquitous across, across a wide range of meteorological domains. Uh, it's important that the GLM now provides a national and international baseline of freely available lightning data, and it establishes a baseline for widespread government and industry implementation. The GLM also moves things forward uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, from the traditional point sources of lightning information to more of a rapidly updating 2D map that portrays the full spatial extent of the lightning activity. As, as I showed in the previous few slides, many operational users have eagerly embraced this new source of lightning information and have already incorporated it into their workflow. We expect the value to quickly multiply as these realized benefits spread to other decision makers. Um, and despite this widespread use of lightning data, the GLM still remains in its infancy and much of its value has yet to be fully realized. So there's lots of work continues to be done. A couple of applications I didn't mention uh, in the value assessment that I wanted to note here. Uh, the GLM has, has found uh, very eager users in scientists that detect and characterize bolides uh, or bright meteors that are burning up in the atmosphere. Uh, the, it, it, the GLM not only detects these bolides, but it provides light curves. And by that, I mean it provides a time intensity recording of the bolide impact and disintegration. And so in the bottom right here, I'm showing the intensity of this meteor as it burn up. And in this case, it was in the center US. So it's one of these yellow ones here. And in that case, they can use both the goes east and goes west GLM and get a very detailed trajectory of how this entered the atmosphere uh, and how it burn up in the atmosphere. And the scientists like that because they can they can backtrack and, and do a, a back trajectory and determine where the rock came from and it helps them to validate their models in terms of is that did that rock from this part of space burn up the way we thought it would and they can scale that up to uh, to better prepare for for potential impacts from much larger um, meteors and so another application that's kind of closer um, more public facing uh, more obvious is for the national weather service we've seen uh, at least a dozen or more cases of meteors creating very loud noises that startle the public and the weather service is one of the first folk, first places that folks call to try to get answers. And so here's a couple of posts. Uh, here's one post from Pittsburgh. Uh, there's been several others, like I mentioned, uh, but what they said is they are able to go look at the GLM and confirm that yes, that loud noise you heard was from a meteor. And on this day, it was uh, near Christmas, or no, it was New Year's Day and it was happened to be cloudy and so nobody saw it they just heard the loud noise and so in this case it was very useful to help calm the public's nerves another one is monitoring for volcanic eruptions this um, is, is one of the most impactful volcanic eruptions um, definitely during our light, lifetime but what you see here i'll let it circle back through but towards the end you can see more lightning but just as the volcano erupts you see a bunch of glm lightning and then none except for where the shock wave interacts with these clouds and, and helps to enhance their, their up, updrafts and perhaps creates thunderstorms where they wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And this actually happened uh, across the world. And, and so again, lightning right at the beginning, and then as the ash cloud moves away, more lightning. And, and what I want to note is that there was lightning occurring that whole time. And so what I've shown here, this is from the, the Woolen network, which does see the radio waves, not the optical light. And so it's not as affected by the ash cloud. And it confirmed that there was continuous lightning occurring and actually some very fascinating types of lightning, concentric rings as it, as it propagated out. Uh, been a few studies published since to show just how remarkable the lightning was with this otherwise remarkable event on its own. So now I just want to spend a few minutes here uh, describing how to access some GLM imagery. And so what you'll see here is a, a visual depiction of going to the GOES image viewer. So you see the link up there to the top left. In this case, I picked the Southeast US. I go to the second panel over for GLM flash extent density. They have static images and also this animation loop. And so you can see, uh, you could zoom into the region you selected and see just how the lightning is occurring. You can change the loop duration and the size, and then you can build an animation and download it and include it in your presentation. So this is one of the, the very first places I, I recommend folks check uh, when they want to, uh, to access some GLM imagery for use in either a project or a presentation. Another one that I referenced earlier is the Weather Nerds website. And this one, 
provides it, it's tropical themed, but it works in the mid latitudes as well. It provides the, the total optical energy, the flash extent density. And as I mentioned earlier, it provides in addition to the gridded products, it also provides the flash points from the GLM. And in this case, you can see that display might be preferable because the gridded product kind of covers up the very important details within this hurricane eye wall and the lightning points are, are much clearer. And it provides a lot of other um, overlays too that may not be available on other data sets or websites. Another one that's really helpful, I think a lot of a lot of folks already use this uh, in the US for their weather information. And so it was nice that they were able to add the GLM to that. The College of DuPage meteorology webpage. Um, for those not familiar, for those that are, there's a lot of options over here. The number of frames, which bands do you want to put on the background, which sector do you want to view? Um, but to get the GLM, it's not in this main uh, selection here. You go to product overlays and you select goes derived from the bottom here. And then they have the GLM flash extent density and the GLM flash points uh, that you could select. And then it'll overlay it with your whatever other background imagery you'd like. For instance, the, the sandwich products available here and all the different individual channels. This archive, uh, it, it might not be completely up to date, but it goes back a while. And what it provides, if you go to the Dropbox flash skeletons, there's a daily um, most interesting lightning flash that Michael Peterson documented. And he provides, in this case, this is a nine second flash uh, that he shows the evolution of it. And so there's one a day going back several years. Uh, so lots of different cases that you could go just to get a better feel for how these lightning flashes evolve. And then there's some composite imagery too, like I've shown here, if you wanna look at um, like you know, a whole month at a time or a whole year at a time uh, for different periods of time or different regions. So then we have a, a website at the University of Maryland. It isn't as up to date as it probably should be, but it does provide a lot of the links I showed here today. And in addition to some, some additional commentary describing what data can be found where, and so there's these four different tabs uh, or five different tabs that you can select uh, to get access to real time data. Forecasters tab has a lot of information on training uh, and enthusiasts. That's just more of the, um, the imagery examples, um, Dropbox stuff that I showed on the previous slide. So, again, here's a summary of the links that I provided and uh, that I described the, the CZM GLM globe that may that link may not still be active. And so if it doesn't work, that's because it's not. Be happy to answer any questions that you may have submitted uh, during the talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Wiglowski, for such an informative presentation on GLM. So just to summarize, we had an overview of GLM and Dr. Rudlowski also showed uh, information about lightning data from uh, Star Goes Viewer, how to uh, access the data, view the images, and also there were several other websites which can point to this information. So this brings us to conclusion of this training on introduction to lightning observations and applications. And just a brief summary, uh, we started with what lightning is and how it forms. Um, now, lightning is high current electrical discharge between positively and negatively charged regions of a thunderstorm. We reviewed that as ice particles grow within uh, developing clouds or storm, they collide and they break apart in, in a variety of sizes. And these particles acquire positive and negative charges and form charged layers under the influence of gravity and updraft within the clouds. Uh, when these char charged layers are, are formed, they, they, they build electrical potential and they result in electrical discharge. That's how, that's what we call lightning. Then in session one, uh, Dr. Goodman provided uh, background and history of lightning uh, detection from 1960s to present. Uh, he mentioned that uh, space -borne lightning measurements Focused lightning measurements actually started uh, since 1980s from space shuttle era. And then 
Uh, in session two, uh, Dr. Lang uh, described other missions such as MicroLab 1 or PU1 uh, for lightning measurements using optical transient detector. Then came TRIM and ISS with lightning imaging sensor uh, to, to measure lightning. And uh, today, Dr. Orlowski talked about a geostationary lightning mapper uh, from GOES. Uh, we also talked about um, Fermi satellite gamma ray burst monitor that can detect short-term lightning from space. Then we also heard from Dr. Goodman about future lightning measurements from space if, through GeoXO lightning mapper. Talking about suborbital lightning measurements, uh, be it fixed or deployable networks or airborne lightning measurements, uh, Dr. Lang talked about these uh, sensors a lightning mapping array or LMA that uses very high frequency antenna to detect lightning. Um, then uh, there, were, there was an overview of various regional LMA networks. Um, also lightning instrument package, uh, they measure electrical field change. And there are several airborne lightning data sets. Of course, um, short term flights were arranged, uh, which included lightning instrument package or LIP. Uh, flies eye GLM simulator facts and electrical field change uh, meter e EFCM. Um, then uh, we also saw uh, Global Hydrometeorological Research Center or GHRC um, site how all the lightning data can be accessed. There are tools to visualize. Um, there is a visualization dashboard of a lightning in GHRC also. And today uh, we saw how uh, GLM data can be viewed and accessed. And there are several uh, benefits of lightning measurements, as we saw throughout this training, can be used for raising lightning safety awareness as an indicator of wildfire ignition potential uh, for risk assessment for power outages an indicator of storm intensity an essential climate variable with other variables uh, for aviation and marine weather safety and for monitoring volcanic eruptions. As you can see in this figure from ISS list, uh, TRIM and ISS provided long-term global picture of uh, lightning flash rates and it showed us how the spatial pattern and in global tropical landmass, there's so many high uh, intensity of flash rates than over oceans or, or other regions. Just a reminder about homework. Uh, it's posted today on training webpage and answers must be submitted via Google Forms by 17th of April. Um, people who attended all three live webinars and complete the homework assignments by the deadline will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after completion of the course. We want to acknowledge all our speakers and thank them very much for their excellent presentations and information. Uh, Dr. Stephen Goodman, Dr. Timothy Lang, and Dr. Scott Rudlowski were our guest speakers. We also had great help from Dr. Christopher Schultz as coordinator for this training. Here's contact information for Dr. Rudlowski. If you have a question about GLM or any related topic, uh, you can contact us with any additional information. Uh, here is a, the RSET website link where you will find all the training material and recordings available. The homework is also posted on the training uh, web page that you can access from here. Uh, here is our uh, social media link and develop and severe our, our capacity building sister programs that you can visit to learn more about. So we want to thank you all for attending this training um, and we will now go to question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, thanks for attending this session and this uh, training and also thank our speaker today, Dr. Rudlowski, and we'll move on to question and answer sessions now. Uh, we already have a few questions, um, and Dr. Rudlowski has answered them. So what I'm going to do is read the questions, 
and then uh, Dr. Rutlowski, you can unmute and perhaps uh, explain these answers. So question one is at night for a single lightning event for a fraction of a second, the entire area lights up. Is the amount of light proportional to the energy released? And thank, thank you for uh, attending today and thanks for these questions. Uh, mentioned here, there, there's a lot of other factors that contribute to how bright the lightning appears from where you're standing or where the observer is. Um, but in general, the stronger the lightning, uh, the brighter it is. And so um, very strong cloud to ground flashes, uh, for instance, produce more energy and they're a lot brighter uh, as opposed to cloud in cloud flashes tend to not carry as much current and in turn tend to not be quite as bright. Thank you. And moving on to second question, in the use case of in-flight storm um, avoidance, are all the pilots making their own decisions in real time or are they following centralized predictions of where the storm is moving? I, I speak to this kind of just from secondhand knowledge, you know, not, not being in this, this okay. business, but or, or being a, a pilot myself or a, a forecaster that deals with aviation forecasting. Uh, but from what I understand, the, the decision always lies with the pilots and they do what they need to do to, to stay safe. Um, but they do fly these predefined routes that will consider the weather impact. So um, there's the National Weather Service, each of the forecast offices and the Aviation Weather Center, they provide a lot of products that are consumed um, by the airlines and, and those that are planning uh, what's going to happen. And so they base a lot of their, um, their routes on forecasts and then in real time, uh, when the thunderstorms are occurring, uh, oftentimes they'll delay a flight's departure to avoid thunderstorms that they would encounter en route or at the destination. And, and so those decisions are again made by folks that are coordinating on the ground. Um, but once the once the pilots in the air, jets of a certain size have uh, a, a front a radar on the front of it, and so they can use that to help avoid thunderstorms. That does unfortunately have a you know, fairly short range at the speeds that these pilots fly. And so that's where these other data sets come, come in handy. Uh, it allows the, the pilots to see further ahead and to, to divert the flight um, you know, earlier when it's more convenient than uh, waiting until waiting you get closer to the threat and, and then urgently needing to reroute. Great. Uh, question three is, you stated that the GLM is an imager, not a detector. What work has been done on writing detectors that work on sequences of GLM images? Yeah, I wasn't sure on the specifics here. Yeah. So I mentioned that there is quite a bit of work being done on two different fronts. So the GLM data that comes out of the ground system is what we call the level two GLM data. And that consists of events, groups, and flashes. The events are the most raw observation that's a, a single pixel being illuminated for a two millisecond period of time. Uh, the groups are then um, collections of events. So during the same two millisecond that are coincident to one another. Uh, and so then, you know, then time and space are brought into flashes and there's time and space criteria that combine the, the groups into flashes. And so when you talk about sequencing, that's one of the ways they, they look at this point level data how are the events being merged into groups being um, merged into flashes? And I, I think there's a lot of a lot of room for more work on that too, uh, especially for for researchers that focus on grouping algorithms and um, how how do you group these rapid sequences of event? I mean, that lightning is a natural example and it occurs all the time. And so we I've, we've dabbled in that a little bit, but there's probably some some really um, like with DB scan and those types of clustering. Um, applications. There could be some really cool stuff that could be done. Um, and then the other one is the optical imagery itself, and that's the gridded products or um, kind of accumulating the, the optical brightness on a, um, you know, pixel by pixel basis, but over the whole scene as opposed to the flash by flash level. So I wasn't sure which this was asking, but I figured I'd describe both of those. Yes, thank you. Uh, question four, I have a 400 kilometer square study area that has been running for the last four years. How do I best find all GLM data with high flash density over the area? 
I'm trying to find the dates on which there are lightning over the study area. Yes, yeah, so that's a, another great question. And um, the, the level two data that I mentioned, it, it's what's most easily, uh, well, it's what's formally archived on what's called NOAA class. Uh, but it, it's it's in 20 second files and it's kind of hard to work with um, the file formatting. And so part of the idea with these gridded products is that it would make it easier for users to, to manipulate and, and look through uh, large quantities of the data. The, the level two files are also much larger than these gridded products. And so I put a link here. This we're still filling backfilling this archive of the gridded products, but it's available um, through the if you follow this link at the GFC or Goddard Space Flight Center has a, a DAC or a data center. And so these data are available through the cloud. And that's what I'd suggest is that you access those data um, and you know, query them for your location and then just do um, look at the you know, various stats. What was the greatest flash density during that day and you know, what hours during the day was there lightning, whatever you might be interested in. Great, thank you. Uh, the last question, um, is there any prone connection between lightning and specific rocks like granite? I don't know of any formal studies on it. I, I think folks have looked at it, but I don't know um, recently if they have. Uh, but there's, when I tell folks that I study lightning, uh, I'll often hear stories, uh, folks just confused why lightning's hitting a certain spot more than it should. And so there's anecdotal evidence. Lots of folks have said, you know, I think, you know, maybe because my yard, it has this soil or rock composition that I'm, it's attracting lightning, but I don't know of any any formal studies that have, have documented that. A lot of the times, like for instance, if 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 the assumption is, I'm not saying that this is the case, but the assumption that it's attracted to granite, um, is that because the granite spires are what's tallest and lightning's just hitting the tallest thing around? Um, the, you know, those are the types of things that you have to consider, but um, I've definitely heard anecdotal evidence of folks and sometimes pretty compelling um, and you know, not having seen the scene myself, uh, was of interest to me as a scientist. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, question six is how real time are these systems for aviation and other applications? How long does it take to process from detection to forecast? So it's, it depends. Yeah, that, that's a, a broad range, but from detection, it's nearly instantaneous. So the GLM from geostationary orbit, um, it observes the light from the cloud top process it into these events, groups, and flashes, sends that data to the ground and distributes, distributes it to users all within 20 seconds. And so when a 20 second file, every 20 second a file completes, before the next file completes, that previous file will already be with users. And so it's, it's incredibly quick. And same with the ground-based networks, they, they can instantaneously report this. Um, and so that's, that's one of the main advantages of lightning data is that it's it's collected and distributed almost instantaneously. Now, when you try to combine it with other data sets and build products, that's when you add latency. Um, but for a forecaster sitting at a forecast desk trying to make an operational decision, uh, Lightning is one of the, the most rapidly updating and readily accessible data sets that they have. Um, and so when I mentioned building radar gaps, there's, you know, Radar coverage in the lower 48 is great. There are some gaps where they just can't see the storms as well as they'd like to. Um, but even where the radar coverage is good, oftentimes they need to wait for the, the radar to scan the entire volume. And so that can take two, three, four, five, and six minutes. Um, and in, that mean, in the meantime, they're looking for other data sets to help them make their decision. And so if a forecaster is looking at a storm and they're thinking about issuing a warning and the radar trends look right, but sometimes they'll say, oh, let's wait for one more bit of radar information. But at the same time, the lightning is saying, well, no, this storm is really getting strong. Sometimes they'll issue that warning before that next radar scan comes in. So it increases their confidence when they're, they're putting out those warnings. And so in, in that process, we're talking again, not instantaneous, but minutes, you know, the, the single to, you know, less than five minutes that forecasters this data being observed to a forecaster actively making a decision based off of it. Great. Uh, question seven, is the thunderstorm intensity occurring more frequently in the tropical region or in the polar region? 
I think I know what the the I think I know what there's probably a little more context needed with the the question here, but um, the, the answer is probably both, but it depends on what time scale you're looking at. And so there have been a lot of researchers that have noted uh, lightning in in the polar regions where they haven't necessarily seen it before. Part of that is because we now have networks that can detect it in those regions. Um, but part of it is because lightning maybe is occurring uh, further north and further south than it used to. And in the tropical regions, that's uh, it's it varies so substantially that I can't really say whether lightning is occurring more or less frequently in the tropical region. It depends on so many factors uh, that that would it would be hard for me to um, to generalize in this case. So question eight is what type of ground network do you have in the US to compare with GLM data products? Uh, do you have a network of observers at synoptic stations reporting the occurrence of storms? Yeah, so in, in a lot of cases that's automated now, but they still do have um, at airports, they have weather observers and every hour they report whether they heard thunder during that hour. Um, and the, the ASOS or automated surface observing system also reports whether there was lightning uh, or whether thunder was recorded, but um, at, at airports, the, the weather observer does note that still to this day. Uh, the ground networks that we have in the US are plentiful. It really helped us not only in getting ready for the GLM and showing forecasters examples of what it might look like, um, but also to complement the GLM observations. So we always stress that to forecasters is that these data sets, the ground based ones and the satellite based ones are always best used in conjunction. It really helps to complete the picture. Um, but in the US, we have the, the oldest one is what's called the National Lightning Detection Network. And that's been around in various forms since the 80s. And that's a, a very, uh, very robust and reliable data set um, that, that, like I said, has been used for decades. Uh, there's a newer one now. The Earth Networks has a, a lightning network, total lightning network, that has a pretty extensive presence in the US, but also globally. Um, and, and so in the US, the Earth Networks is able to see a little bit more of the intracloud lightning than the NL, NLDN is. And so, again, those two are used by weather service forecasters alongside the GLM. Um, and then the other interesting ones, we have lightning mapping arrays, which provide very detailed 3D observations, but over a fairly small area. Um, and then more recently, folks have deployed kind of one off um, interferometer networks. Uh, I have a colleague that's building Raspberry Pi cameras that are um, taking somewhat high speed imagery to help validate the various networks. And so um, we have pretty robust observations in the US to help provide some ground truth to the GLM. But in the end, there's nothing that's the same. They're all seeing the lightning differently. And, and so you have to make some general generalizations when you're comparing the ground based and the satellite based data. Great. Uh, question nine is what visualization tool do you use on pages 12 and 13? Generally, uh, could you recommend software to process and analyze flash data? Yeah, it depends. I don't remember. Let me look to see what slide that was. Um, I don't recall offhand. But I use a number of different, a uh, number of different. Python is my main coding language. I moved on from Fortran a long, long time ago. So Python, I do almost everything in there. Even even the stuff I used to do in ArcGIS is now done in Python. Um, so the the visualizations that I make are all almost always use use Python. Um, but some of my colleagues use a lot more elaborate things. And so yeah, the one you're referencing is from Michael Peterson, um, the world record lightning flash. And um, Michael Peterson, if you haven't Googled him, do that. The Google Scholar, he's got dozens of papers that are very interesting. And he's done some just tremendous visualizations, uh, kind of like a savant when it comes to visualizing data. And so what I think he did in this case is he hacked the software called Blender and kind of made it do things that it wasn't necessarily designed to do. And so folks that are familiar with it that have seen it were just kind of flabbergasted by what he had done. And so I think both of those are from the Blender um, software package. And I don't know much about that at all. Uh, but Michael Peterson would be somebody to reach out to. 
um, if you're interested in how he's made use of that tool. That's fantastic. Uh, question 10 is how do you deal with the uh, sparsing of the data from GLM electric drift movement? How does the uh, polygon mixing help improve the model and they don't seem to be the same resolution. Is it uh, vector based temporally uh, reconstruction technique from multiple sources, but how sparsing is dealt again? I don't know how to answer that question. So hopefully I'm Hopefully I'm not completely off base with my response, but I think this is referencing how the GLM grid is non uniform. And um, so, as for instance, at the at Nader directly under the, the satellite, our pixel resolution is roughly 8 by 8 kilometers. Uh, but once you get out to the edges of the field of view, it's closer to 13 or 14 kilometers on a side, each of the pixels and in between it varies. And it's it's almost hard to predict how it varies unless you know because the we're we built into the GLM what's called a variable pitch array, and so that the variable pitch array was designed to help um, diminish the increase in size. They wanted to keep the smaller pixels as long as they could um, before you get to the larger pixels, and so. If you look at the actual GLM pixel map, it it's it does have some really funny shapes. And at in the gridded products, if you look at the gridded products, especially at higher latitudes, uh, they'll look funny. The same flash will look different shape from the goes west versus the goes east because the pixels are are larger there and they're they're oddly shaped at times. You know, like a trapezoid, don't you know, not like a, a diamond or a circle or anything, but it's just not a square or a rectangle. Thank you. Uh, the next question is How often is the software running on the GLM satellite updated with um, new algorithms? So early on, it was updated quite frequently when when we first turned it on uh, again, it was the 1st of its kind sensor. There was a lot of stuff that we couldn't predict while it was on the ground. And so in the, in the early years, say the 1st, 2 to 3 years, it was updated. The software was updated every 6 or so months um, to, to update various filters and to, to change some settings. Uh, but now they've settled into more of a cadence of maybe once a year that kind of there's big updates. There's little like lookup tables that are uploaded more frequently, um, but nothing substantial. Um, and you also have to think there's updates to the actual software on the satellite, and there's updates to the the ground system that's producing the products. And so those those two things both occur, but uh, much less frequently now than earlier on in the satellite's lifetime. Great, thank you. So, uh, if you still have questions, we have some time. So, please go ahead and post them on in the chat box. Those are good questions. Helps to round it out. I'm glad to see the interest. So while uh, you're posting your questions, uh, we just have um, something to remind you that there will be an um, end of training survey that will be uh, sent to you by email. Um, we always have a survey at the end of the training to get your feedback. So we re request you to take a few moments to finish the survey uh, because that that helps us in in improving our future trainings also we want to know what other topics you're interested in so please have a look at the survey and please take a few moments to complete the surveys uh, to to get that so we get uh, good feedback on on the training there's one more question is a, a long strike the same as long uh, continuing current strike
sorry, I had trouble finding my mute button, even though it's right there. Um, the, a long strike. So when I was showing earlier, I was showing the, the flashes that cover long distances. Um, those are different from flashes that have long continuing current. And, um, but those flashes are more likely to produce ground strikes that do have continuing current. So um, they're somewhat related, uh, but also uh, kind of discussing two different things. So you, you can have, for instance, you can have a flash that lasts um, half a second and have no continuing current in it, and it can traverse quite a great distance in half a second. Um, as opposed to that, you could have a smaller flash that doesn't traverse as long of a distance in the cloud, um, but lasts a half second and has several continuing currents during it. Question 13, is there any way to estimate predict the intensity of cloud to ground given an observed cloud to cloud behavior currently being observed from the ground? Yeah, that's a great point. So that's, um, that's one of the, the advantages to having intracloud observations is that the first few flashes in a storm are almost always intracloud. And so if you're only observing the cloud to ground flash, uh, that storm could already be producing lightning and you didn't know about it. And so having access to data that observes the intracloud portion will oftentimes give you several minutes lead time, you know, up to 30 minutes. Sometimes these storms will produce just small infrequent cloud flashes um, for some period of time before they produce a cloud to ground flash. So, yeah, it's really important um, if a forecaster sees uh, an increase in intercloud lightning um, that they anticipate that it's likely going to begin producing cloud to ground lightning as well. So, uh, in continuation, uh, re reference to question 11, how often is software running on GLM? Here's question 14 says, can you treat GLM data series as a homogeneous or uh, proper for climate studies? How do you prepare data for these purposes? Another great question. Um, as it stands, um, you can't go back to the beginning of the GLM record and assume that it'll be homogeneous. Uh, we don't. We haven't gone back and reprocessed it. So when these new filters were, were put in place and they fixed some of these artifacts, uh, we didn't go back and retrospectively um, fix the old data. And so what I generally generally recommend is the data beginning in about 2019. Is, is when you can really count on it being of, of better quality. Um, and by 2020, the, the data between 2020 and now is, is fairly homogeneous in terms of instrument and settings. So it's just really 2017 and 2018 that you need to exercise some, some caution with. That's great. So it's about five years of data, yeah. Um, and we are we are working on a project to um, reprocess the old data mm -hmm. with the current settings, and so that should be available sometime in the next year or so. Great. Uh, question fifteen: Is there a way to identify long uh, continuing current strikes? I am interested in the in this regarding wildfire ignitions. Me too. <laughs> That's what I, I spend a ton of time looking at. And it's a fascinating question. With the ground-based networks, you really can't see it. So the, the, the ground-based networks like the NLDN and the ENTLN, unless you look very closely at the waveforms, you can't necessarily say it on a flash-by-flash -flash basis. Uh, but the GLM, the optical sensor, does allow you to get a much better estimate of long continuing current. And so what we look for is, um, Within a flash, uh, is there is there a pixel or a group or an event that's recurring for some period of time? And so, what I'll do is is I'll look at the the number of consecutive groups. So within a flash, there's allowed to be some period of time where there's no light within the footprint. There's there's a 330 millisecond time window. Um, but if you look within that flash, say it lasted um, half a second you can look at two millisecond intervals at each individual pixel or group of pixels. And so if you sequence those, and, and I'll allow for one, one, um, one frame with no light, and I'll still call it a consecutive frame. 
you can get a, a, an estimate within each of the flashes, what was the number of consecutive frames. And that'll give you a pretty good proxy for continuing current. Question 16, how can the electric field be captured with such resolution? Is there exposure problems occurring with varying angles? Yeah, so the, to, to be precise with my language, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't measure the electric field per se. You know, it's looking at the optical distribution of lightning and, and it sees what it can see. And, and so there are problems when you look at the varying angles. Um, I mentioned already how the pixel sizes are different. And so if you have a, an optical source that makes the same amount of light within a smaller pixel, it's going to be more likely to be seen than if it makes that same amount of light in a larger pixel. Um, it's, it's, you need brighter, a little bit more light in those smaller pix or in those bigger pixels for it to be detected. Um, and then also at that, at those steeper viewing angles, you're sometimes looking at the sides of clouds. Um, sometimes storms in the foreground are obscuring storms in the background um, behind kind of, you can't see through it. So you see the, the lightning from the first storm, but not the second. And so, uh, yes, there are, there are issues in, um, there's, yes, some small settings that are made to help, um, account for this, uh, but it's, it's kind of unavoidable and it needs to be taken into account, um, for applications that rely on that kind of uniformity. Question 17, are there false alarms detected by the GLM? Yep, yeah, there's, there's more false alarms than we necessarily would like, um, but there's, there's good false alarms and there's bad false alarms. And so I, I mentioned earlier the, the bolide uh, application. So you know, we're not designed to see these meteors exploding in the atmosphere, but the fact that we do is actually very advantageous for those researchers. They're able to, um, they're able to use those to validate their models so they can do very detailed trajectories, especially where both GLMs see it. And then they can do back trajectories and see where that space rock came from. Um, and then they model how that rock breaks up. And then now they have a really good depiction of how it did break up, how bright it was at various stages. And, and so, um, you know, that's an example of a false alarm um, being helpful. And yes, we do see rocket launches at times. Uh, there was a SpaceX SpaceX rocket that exploded a couple of years back off the coast of Texas, and we saw a number of signals from from that rocket explosion. Um, rocket launches by themselves not quite as likely to see, um, but that SpaceX one made such a bright and it doesn't just have to be bright; it has to be bright and rapidly changing. And so, um, usually, you need more than just a rocket launch to to trigger um, a false alarm, but other sources of false alarm are sun glint, and we have filters that help to deal with uh, sun glint off of either a, a calm body of water or even solar arrays. Uh, those cause those cause issues. Um, and then there's just there's artifacts with the instrument. We have pixels that can become hot pixels and um, become overly sensitive. We only have a couple of those um, between the two instruments. But yeah, there's lots of different sources of false alarms, and we do our best to um, to filter them out. The, the real trade off is we want to detect as much as we can with as few false alarms. And so that's that's the real trade off that we'll always have to pick one or the other. Great. Yes, thank you. We'll give, give a few more minutes. Uh, so if you have questions for think of something, please do enter in the chat box. There was one question about homework points. Um, so for now, uh, each question or each Google form answer that you provide, it's one point. So homework should be posted. Um, and uh, you will also be looking at GLM images for one of the homework um, questions. Uh, and um, it, it's due on 17th of April. OK, 
again we want to thank dr rudlowski for his time and his the information that he provided today um, i also want to thank the rset team uh, for for coordinating and helping and setting up this uh, webinar series um, selvin hudson odoy natasha johnson griffin jonathan o'brien sarah karshell um, brock blevins and sean mccartney all of them have helped with this webinar series in addition to all our guest speakers and uh, dr chris schultz who helped in coordinating uh, all these webinars so thank you all Oh, there's one more question. Uh, do the lenses have uh, obturation control or uh, occurring lightning or is it treated in software? Uh, both. Okay, great. I'm not sure if, that, if I'm saying it for, if obturation control is, is the filtering, but there is filtering on the lens itself. And then there's also in the software, they deal with um, artifacts as well. So we'll give it a couple of more minutes if you have any more questions. And once again, thank you all for attending this webinar series. There's one more question. What sort of artifact are you encountering because of the exposure in the uh, data unfiltered? Lots of different artifacts, probably too, too many to, to, to um, summarize here. Um, in the unfiltered data, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of filtering uh, because of it. I'm not sure how to answer that one directly. Yeah, so I mean, uh, later on, if if there's any document or any reference we can refer to, we'll provide that, or you can share with us uh, so that people can read it if they want to. What kind of artifact artifacts there can be? Uh, next question is how. How do aviation specific weather apps assistant, assist pilots and aviation professionals in navigating thunderstorm hazards, avoiding uh, turbulence and making informed decision about flight routes and schedules? 
Yeah, my impression is that the aviation specific weather apps are, are super helpful to pilots in the cockpit. Um, and they provide a, a great way to directly, now that they all, most of these big planes have Wi-Fi, um, it's a way to directly provide real-time updates um, on weather conditions to the pilots. And so I think when uh, developers are, are working to incorporate the new observations into aviation applications, uh, they're working with these weather apps because that's, you know, they want to meet the pilots where they are. And so I think that's a very important, uh, very important avenue um, for collaboration and product development between you know, researchers and uh, pilots and the, the forecasters. The next question is, can the GLM image electric structures above the clouds like sprites and elves? Typically, sprites and elves are too dim um, in the, the wavelength that we're at, uh, but we can see the characteristic flashes that we know to make these upper air lightning phenomena. And so we can, um, for instance, we can look at a flash and say if it's of a certain intensity, um, then it's more or less likely to have produced a sprite or an elf or a gigantic jet or you know the other various halos. Question 22. In a lightning-prone area, does installing lightning uh, arresters, uh, planting tall trees, reduce the risk of human exposure? Yeah, I think the key here is, is the human element. Um, in places where lightning safe structures do exist, um, the, the most effective means of keeping people safe is making them aware of the threat, both before it's presenting itself and especially during the, the threat um, time period. Uh, but in places where there aren't lightning safe structures, it's very important to install um, lightning arresters. Uh, Dr. Marianne Cooper is doing tremendous work with the ACL, ACL ACLE net in Africa, where they're installing lightning protection on schools um, because these schools aren't aren't safe. And so when when there's thunderstorms in the area, oftentimes uh, parents would keep their parents home or keep their kids home with them rather than sending them to a school that might be um, at risk uh, from lightning. And so in those places where they've installed even just one building, the, the local school where they've installed lightning protection it's been tremendously popular and so if you're interested in that and the lightning safety i, I definitely recommend you look into acle net and marianne cooper um, and the work they're doing can be replicated in other places for sure great uh question 23 what accessibility features do weather apps offer to ensure that individuals with visual or hearing impairments can um, timely receive timely information and alerts about thunderstorms. I'm not sure about the specifics of the weather apps. What I can speak to is our lightning safety campaigns. Um, they've taken they've taken um, they've taken an action to make the the lightning safety message more accessible. And so I, I don't know of specific examples, but I know that they've they've released things that were specifically targeted targeted at individuals with visual or hearing impairments um, to help inform them of the lightning threat and the tools and information that's available to them ahead of the time. Um, I can't speak as well to in real time, but I imagine the weather service has enabled um, this type of messaging. They, they do their best to not leave anybody out. So I, I would think that's a safe assumption that they've, at least the weather service messaging includes um, some, some in, increased accessibility. And I don't know about the weather apps themselves, but I imagine, you know, in good business, they would be doing that. These are some other great questions, and thank you so much for answering them, Dr. Budlowski. Um, 
we will be posting this question and answer document on our website as well on the training page one more question is has anyone tried sonification of lightning data um i'm not sure mm. i'm not sure what that means maybe if they're talking about um dealing with the audio and rather than the the radio metric or the or could, could be sound they're talking about? Yeah, I, I have seen some recent studies that have looked at how the sound from lightning propagates and how that differs um, in urban and rural settings. And I think there is that scenario that may be ripe for research. Uh, it could be that there's already existing networks of microphones that have been picking it up. That would be very ripe data sets to, to study for a specific purpose. I'm not sure what that purpose is right now, but I'm sure there's a number of them. So we are getting close to the end time for this webinar series. Um, we just have a couple of more minutes if you have any questions. Otherwise, we thank you for attending uh, this webinar series. And we look forward to your survey response. So if, if we still have a couple of more minutes left, if there are any uh, questions, you can put them in the chat box. So if there are no more questions, thanks again for attending this webinar, and we hope to see you in our next RSA training. We have one more question. What is the wavelength used with GLM? Is it reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere? The GLM is at 777.4 nanometers. Thank you everyone. So we'll be closing uh, this webinar and uh, please visit the training webpage for the homework. Yeah, so how frequently we can have GLM images for a particular area? I think it's been mentioned. Continuously, continuously yeah. observing within its field of view. So um, the data comes down every 20 seconds. The gridded products are produced every minute. 